Now, as we move into Genesis chapter 7, as we continue in our account of the flood and the types of the church and the types of the believer and the types of the unbeliever and, of course, the types of Christ, we're going to be looking at a segment which we're going to call a call to transformation. So let's read these first five verses and then examine each one in a little greater detail. Beginning in verse 1 of chapter 7, we read, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights. And every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Now, beginning in verse 1, we note a couple of things here. First of all, he says, the Lord says to him, For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation, speaking directly to Noah. He says to Noah, I have found you righteous in this generation. In the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ will be the only one who will be righteous. And of course, he is also called the Lord, the righteous judge in the New Testament. And he is righteous because he is the only one who has lived sinless. Now, of course, the Bible tells us there is no one except the Lord Jesus Christ who is sinless, but in that Noah has been found righteous, he is a type of the Christ in that he is one that has been found righteous in his generation. Now, that term generation is the Hebrew word dor, and literally what it means is a time period of posterity. That means we're talking about a particular time period within, not, not in other words, not a genealogy, not from parent to grand to child to grandchild to great grandchild and so forth. We're talking about a specific period in time. Right now, your family lives in this time period. So as God surveyed the scene at present within this time frame, he said, Noah, you're the only one that I'm finding who is righteous. So you and your family are going to be invited into the ark. When we compare this to that same word genealogy or that same word of, of generation that's found at the beginning of Matthew chapter 1, these are the generations or this is the generation of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's speaking of descendants. That's speaking of their beginning with David and going all the way down to Joseph who the genealogy of Joseph is get given in Matthew chapter 1 in the beginning or the early portion of Matthew chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 3, we also find the lineage of Mary, that generation of the Lord Jesus Christ as it goes through Mary, which also passes through David as well. Verses 2 and 3, we find these clean and unclean animals. And some people have asked that question. Why are there clean animals? Why are there unclean animals? We didn't really have a, a law as of yet. The Hebrew law was not given until the time of Moses. And here we are pre-flood talking about clean and unclean animals. So we can see that there was an understanding 
of clean and unclean animals. There was obviously an explanation given of the two, and we have a more detailed explanation given in the time of the law. And we could go and look at that in more detail, but for the sake of this discussion, we're not going to spend a long period of time talking about that. But the Lord had what was called a kosher law uh, at the time of Moses and following up until the time of the Lord Jesus, when, of course, the Lord Jesus fulfilled the law. And I have a message out that talks about why we celebrate the Lord Jesus on Sunday now. And it talks that in that message, I talk about a little more extensively how the Lord Jesus has fulfilled the law, and we are no longer under the law, but we fulfill the law by fulfilling the law of love, that is, loving the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves, and thus fulfilling the law. I explain that in greater detail there. But here in Genesis chapter 7, verse 2, of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens, the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two, the male and his female. Verse 3 also speaks of this same thing, of fowls of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of the earth. So the obvious reason for taking the animals of course, is to is that they may reproduce and replenish the earth, repopulate the earth with their kinds after the flood is over and the flood recedes. So when we look at them, we see that we have certain animals that there are only two by two, and other animals there are by sevens. If we go into further into the into the books of the law in the Old Testament, we find out that there are certain animals that are selected by the Lord for sacrifice. And those animals happen to be clean animals. And it's interesting because as we look at those clean animals for sacrifice, we realize that if we were to only take two animals of those kinds, and make a sacrifice to the Lord after the flood, well, you don't have any animals to mate with anymore. If you were to take a male that was without spot or blemish and sacrifice him, well, you have no male to mate with a female of that particular kind, and you lose that kind. We see by sevens for clean animals would appear to indicate three pairs of each male and female plus one additional male for a sacrifice. And often that male was the first male to open up the matrix or open up the womb that is firstborn. And the firstborn is very significant in sacrifice throughout the Old Testament. The firstborn belonged to the Lord. This also agrees with the sacrifice offered in Genesis 8.20 and is in line with the thank offering of Exodus 34.19 and following in that particular passage. Also, the future kosher law, which I mentioned a moment ago, uh, which is found in Leviticus 11, chapter 1, and in and continuing in that portion of, of Scripture, and in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 3, and following in that section. It's also offered or also identified as a sin offering in Genesis chapter 8, uh, verses 20 through 22. So we will see that when we get there. So we see verses 2 and verse, or verses 2 and verses 3 of chapter 7 here that we're in right now. Um, it makes perfect sense that the Lord is preparing to have these animals uh, come in a larger number because these are going to be the sacrificial animals of the future. And of course, not only do you want to have them, but you want to have more of them. And that odd number, that seventh animal, is going to be a male, which is going to be the sacrificial animal for a thank offering 
and for a sin offering, depending on the kind of animal. Now, as we move on to verse 4, the Lord says, For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth. We're going to pause there for a second. What that simply means is that <clears throat> seven days from the day that he speaks to Noah, the rain will fall. There are seven days yet left before the rain begins. And I will cause it to rain upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So seven days from hence, from the time that the Lord is speaking, it will begin to rain and continue for a full 40 days and 40 nights. It's interesting because throughout the Old Testament, periods of 40 were periods of judgment and periods of rest. Uh, a survey of the Old Testament will clearly show that. We see that especially in the times of the judges, but also we see that in other times throughout the Old Testament. There's seven days until the flood commences, and by the way, seven is God's number of absolute perfection, perfect completion, and again, 40 days is a number both of judgment and a number of a time of rest. It could be 40 days, 40 years, which we see very often. Everything on the earth will be blotted out. He says here, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. Everything is going to be blotted out. We've already seen how every breathing creature, everything that breathes breath, will die. Also, every plant, every insect, which most of them have some kind of oxygen exchange, everything that's on the surface of the earth is going to be obliterated. That's why those things those animals are brought onto the ark, the plants will grow back up again. The Lord will take care of that. There is going to be a complete transformation of the world. This is a picture of what takes place at the beginning of Revelation chapter 21 with the new heaven and the new earth after the old one is burnt up of a fervent heat as Peter speaks of in his epistle. Also, um, that would be 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12, by the way. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, of course, talks about a newness in Christ. Old things are passed away. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So this event of clearing out all of the old junk, so to speak, so that it's not even remembered anymore, and everything becoming new, this is a picture of newness in Christ, new life in Christ, the believer's new life in Christ. This also is reflective, uh, as I just mentioned a moment before, out of 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12, of the type of the new heaven and the new earth that will take place as the final transformation that all believers will live on and will experience in eternity. This is beyond the tribulation, beyond the millennial kingdom. This is after the final judgment, uh, the judgment of the righteous for reward and the judgment of the wicked for the for their final punishment in the lake of fire, and then everything starts over again. And that certainly is a subject for, um, for another discussion and another series. Uh, but if you do, if you do want to know more about that, you can look in uh, the Revelation commentary, especially Revelation chapters 20 through 22. There's a lot of information on that as well. Finally, we come to the last verse of this message, which is really one of the most beautiful verses. Genesis 7, 5. And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. Noah didn't have a discussion with the Lord. Noah didn't have a debate with the Lord. 
Noah didn't mull it over for a few days. There were seven days left until this flood was going to take place. Everything was built. The animals were coming aboard. Everything was taking place. This was just perfect obedience. Hebrews 11.7 is a wonderful wrap-up, in fact, for this particular message. Hebrews 11.7 tells us, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, because it had not yet rained upon the earth. A mist came up to water the ground each day, but we had a water canopy. We had the waters divided from the waters. There was water below, which were the seas, and there was water above, which was the water canopy, which protected us from a lot of things. But now that was about to collapse. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Noah, in fact, by obeying God, drew that line of demarcation between righteousness and unrighteousness. Step into the ark, and you are on the righteous side, and you are saved through the tribulation. Stay off of the ark, and you have chosen condemnation. It's the, it's the equivalent of the same thing. In fact, it's a type of the same event that takes place in John chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. We are already under condemnation because we are born under sin. We are born into sin. We have a sin nature. There is none that doeth good. There is none that seeketh after God. Of our own, we do not seek after God. Right? But when we see what righteousness is, we have a choice. Are we going to heed God's call? To come after him and follow him and do righteousness and do godliness and therefore we want our deeds to be manifest may and be exposed to the Lord because the Lord will be pleased with them or do we want to continue in our selfish ways and hide our ways from the Lord because we are ashamed of them just like Adam and Eve were in the garden. So until next time, stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.